Hello, my friends. Welcome to Rollin' Rambles. Everybody's in a damn rush for some reason edition. God, Volkswagen makes stupid looking cars. Anyway, um, that's not the point of the video, but Volkswagen and Audi really do make some pretty dumb looking cars, and I really don't understand why people buy these overpriced, unreliable European monstrosities that don't look good and that have really annoying headlights. <clears throat> yeah, I just don't get it. Okay. So let's talk about user interfaces. I know I've beaten this one to death, but I think that in light of recent experiences, I should probably update you a bit. I have come to realize that things are even worse than I initially thought they were. I had no choice but to set up Windows 11 on a brand new Asus gaming laptop. Actually, a pair of them. Um, I'm really sad that I don't have examples to show you for this video since I'm just driving and how am I going to show you anything? <clears throat> but there are some user interface decisions in Windows 11 that have given me a special amount of annoyance and that make me hate it even more. Um, there is actually one very specific one that stuck out to me and I thought was strange. In the control panel, oh, oh, I'm sorry. It's not called the control panel. It's the settings panel. Oh, oh, and by the way, the settings gear is no longer in a standard location. Now it's a movable icon. The stupidest thing that any Android, iOS, any of that did, making the settings icon where you can change everything else, uh, suddenly no longer in the same place all the time, Oh yeah, it's come to Windows 11. Now, settings could be God knows where anywhere. Now, thank God that the one thing Microsoft has never done wrong when uh, they didn't undo that. The one of the greatest things in Windows 8 and up, um, no, that is not something I can remote into review, sir. And let's put everything in do not disturb mode. Um, one of the greatest things that came out in Windows 8 was the right-click menu on the Start button. Which, by the way, stopped saying Start in Vista, yet we still call it the Start button. <clears throat> and I think it still says Start when you hover over it, but thank God they kept that right-click menu because if they did not, I would have to go digging for settings or run a search for settings every time I wanted to go to the settings panel. The really garbage settings panel that's missing all sorts of settings. So inside this difficult to find settings panel, unless you already know the magic trick of the right click start menu, um, when you do something, it's been this way for a long time, um, control panels in Windows, um, I think, well, okay, control panels in Windows some of them have been HTML applications since Windows 98, actually, if I recall correctly. Um, you double click and instead of opening a separate panel, it might pop into something like, I think the network connections are like that. They show up in an Explorer window uh, with the standard back forward navigation stuff still there. Um, you get the idea. So a, a lot of control panels back in the day were HTML applications that you could go back and forward in as if they were just regular folders, while others bring up a special dialogue for that control panel. Um, that, that multimodal method of operation was a little weird, maybe a little forced, but it, it did at least make sense for, say, the network connections control panel. So you open it and you can see all of your network interfaces listed as if they were files of a sort in a network connections folder. Um, it, it, it honestly was a bit more welcome than previous network connection setup stuff. Um, back long, long ago, uh, you had a special network connection control panel, I think in the Windows 95, 98 era, if I recall correctly, you'd have adapters, and then each one of those adapters could be bound to different protocols, and it was really kind of complex. But now you have individual adapters listed, and then their bindings are under a property sheet for them as if they were just special files. It honestly is a better interface. But now um, the settings panel has that stupid network thing where it's really schizophrenic, like some settings seem duplicated, the paths to things are not as clear, 
they basically threw out a pretty good, you know, network adapters file paradigm in favor of this, like, more garbage version of HTML application stuff where you, you keep the HTML buttons, but you throw away the icon paradigm, you throw away the file paradigm entirely in favor of just hiding everything. Oh, and by the way, if you need to change advanced settings, like uh, beyond just IPv4 and v6 addresses, like if you need to put in a bunch of DNS servers or something, guess what? You still have to open the network connections control panel. Yes, the old one that's been around for 20 plus years and go into the properties that way to bring up the old style property sheet and change the settings in there. So what's the point of the new panel if the old panel does the same thing, but better? Yeah. Anyway, that's not what I was going to complain about. What I was going to complain about is when you open the settings panel, and let's just say you were doing what I was doing. Windows Update. I go to Update and Security or whatever it's called now, and I uh, went through like um, delivery optimization or advanced features or something, whatever. <clears throat> In the top left corner, they have a back button for navigation. Now, one thing I will compliment Microsoft on, they have breadcrumb navigation. So at least if you're giving me a shitty HTML5 uh, application for a settings panel instead of a proper settings panel um, that's not made in a stupid way to force the paradigm, at least um, you're doing so with the breadcrumb navigation so I know how I got there and I can go back partially or fully instead of just having a dumb back button that God knows where it'll actually send you if you click it. Um, that I still have a lot of problems, like for example, you can't have multiple settings panels open at once, which is extremely stupid, uh, but you can have all the control panels you want open all day long and nobody will complain. <laughs> it really, it really is that dumb um, that you, you just can't have a settings panel open for your network adapter and then another settings panel open for like the advanced, ether, you know, advanced settings or whatever you can't have two things open at once. If you open a settings panel for something else through some other interface, it kicks you out of the panel you're in. And the only way to get back to it is to get back, leaving the panel that you're in. Oh, and there's no forward button. So they'll put this HTML paradigm with a back button, but they won't give you a forward button. So you can go back forward to the thing that you had moved into that you backed out of because you weren't expecting it. But <coughs> here's what really got me. In Windows 10, if you go into the settings panel, in the top left corner, there is a back button. If you have a maximized settings panel, okay, and this is this is going to be a little UI lesson for you guys, okay? If you have a maximized settings panel and you whoosh your mouse up, uh, let me see if I can do this so that you can see it as if it's yours. Um, whoosh it up to the upper right corner of the screen. You don't think about it. You don't like go fast and then slow down so that you can precisely point. You know, whoosh, fling it to the corner, all right? In user interface design, the corners and edges of the screens are infinite sinks. If you make a movement, that movement stops at that edge or corner, and all further movement is infinitely sunk. It is discarded. So all movement can be absorbed without changing position. This is really, really critical for certain user interface elements because these the corners in particular are stupid useful because now you can throw your mouse in a direction. It hits the corner reliably because all you have to do is just sort of eh, and it goes to the X or the back button. Windows 10 settings panel, X, back button, okay? Top and bottom, right? And, and of course, if you haven't dragged the taskbar, bottom left corner, start button fling your mouse, bottom left corner, start button. Okay, that's all fine and great, but in the Windows 11 settings panel, for no reason whatsoever other than to show off the rounded edges on the button, I suppose, they have taken the ugly flat back button that was in the top left corner of the Windows 10 settings panel, spanned the whole corner and thus was active to the corner, and thus a fling to the corner would let you do back without any extra playing around. Oh, well, that's gone. Now they've moved the button. So here's the corner, right? And they moved the button here. Now that might not seem like a big deal. Yeah, the button's still there. It's, it's still taking up most of the same amount of space. It's square instead of rectangular. 
but the button's still there, but they just moved it just a few pixels away from the corner. Okay, but it's not in the corner. And it's not, there's no like exception, there's no special behavior that makes it hot all the way to the corner. Do you see where this is going? So I'm doing system administrative administrator administrating. I feel like I just had a technical period. Um, so I'm administrating a system. I'm flicking through control panels, using the back button to go back one step. But now I can't click a thing, do a thing, and click back to get back where I was. Now I have to click a thing, do a thing, and I have to carefully move the pointer up to the corner to hit the back button. Fling it to the corner, then gently nudge it carefully to get to the back button. I know this sounds trivial, but the truth is when you are in the zone working on a problem, the last thing you want to have to do is pause and then really think about, oh, I've got to hit the back button because I missed it. That's the problem. This is the indication that Microsoft is really, really going downhill. Now, I am not going to pretend like there have not been kernel level improvements in every single version of Windows that has ever existed. I can even give compliments to the Vista kernel. In fact, the Vista kernel, it made so many improvements to things under the hood that it would have been nice to have that in XP and just not have Vista. That, when Vista came out, that's what everyone really wanted. They wanted the, the Vista improvements without actually having Vista. They could have done the, um, they could have even done the accelerated um, arrow interface stuff without, um, without requiring the bloated, crappy Vista interface. <clears throat> it's not the kernel in Windows that ruins things. The truth is you cannot be a kernel programmer and be incompetent. It, it's not really possible because if you're a kernel programmer and you're incompetent, you can end up causing massive problems for the company. Um, kernel crashes take down entire systems. Uh, and when you have enterprise customers that you might have contracts with, you are giving guarantees that there's a degree of reliability in your software because they need those guarantees so they can guarantee reliability of their systems for their customers and their employees and so on and so forth. Your, your enterprise customers demand reliability and now, you know, if you have a crappy kernel programmer and things go wrong, you cannot provide that reliability. Well, you're in a bit of a, a, bit of a pickle here now, aren't you? So it's hard to be a kernel programmer and be, good, and be bad at your job. Um, typically, only the best programmers ever end up there because it's a critical part of everything else. Like Literally everything else is built on top of the kernel. It is probably the most thankless thing in existence is kernel programming and maintenance. Um, competent kernel programming and maintenance. There's actually more opportunity for stupid to leak into the Linux kernel than in the Windows kernel. <clears throat> because at least Microsoft has a hiring and vetting process. Linux just accepts the changes at face value. Um, and you know it's entirely up to the maintainers of the Linux subsystem that applies as to whether or not that will even be a thing. So kernel programmers are great. Um, even if you hate Windows, you can't hate the Windows kernel because even though there might be some stupidity floating around under the hood, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it is actually a well-written piece of software. If you go look at the old uh, Windows 2000 and XP source code leaks, um, the articles that were written about them, there has they did a lot of code review on the leaked source code for the Windows 2000 and XP kernels and they were, you know, people were pretty universally impressed with the code quality overall. Like everything seemed very well put together. That's because you can't make a bad kernel without taking down literally everybody else with it. So kernel improvements are great. The problem is that you can't slap the Windows 11 kernel underneath the Windows 7, 8, or 10 interfaces and, you know, user space. So you have to take it as a package deal. You have to take, if you want the Windows 11 kernel improvements, you have to take all the garbage that they've done to everything else along with it. And that's what I'm not really willing to accept for myself. But 
these people had brand new gaming laptops that I told them to get. I recommended them. And they had USB 4. And I had to put Windows 11 on it. And when you're in there and you're doing all these tweaks that you do all the time on 10, and you're on 11, and yes, the system is a little different, but for the most part, I have figured out where most things are so I can still whiz through them pretty well. But today was the first time I really noticed this stupid back button. And it, it's just like one thing that drove me truly nuts. Because this, this is, if you're going in there and you're, let's say, let's say you want to test your sound card. You know, you just want to play a test sound. Okay, ding-a-ding, ding-a-ding, whatever. Big deal. You go into settings, you find the test thing, you close settings. Whoop-de-doo. Maybe you go back and you adjust the volume. I don't know. <clears throat> but let's say that that's not what you're doing. Let's say you're like me and you're going through and adjusting privacy settings and you're going through and adjusting, um, I change the color mode, the window dressing colors, disable all the window spotlight crap, set a nice boring standard offline wallpaper, a nice boring standard offline lock screen. So I'm going back and forth between all these panels to get this system customized and tuned up. And that means that every time I want to go back to the settings panel um, and or back to personalization and go into a different sub panel, I have to hit back. Well, when I go to hit back, I miss it because now unlike Windows 10, it's gone. It, it's not in the corner. It's a few pixels away from the corner. And one time is one thing, but when you're sitting there and every time you get done flicking a whole page full of settings and you go, oh, I'm going to go back and then go into this other one and you miss. And you go, okay, carefully click other one, page full of settings. Oh, I missed again. And it just, after it happens a few times, you start getting pretty pissed off that the skill set you've already acquired is no longer applicable. And not because the offset button is better. There is nothing better. It is objectively a worse interface. It's just because some guy in design or whatever had to justify his job. Oh, well, now everything has rounded elements. So let's pull this button off and show that we're no longer doing the completely flat design thing anymore. <clears throat> and that we've got rounded rounded corners on everything. And I guarantee you that's exactly what they did. They looked at it and they said, this needs to show off our new design paradigm. I would rather you have left the ugly, stupid, flat, colorless, borderless, no indication whatsoever that you can actually click it, back arrow that goes all the way up into the corner so that it is a hot corner. That would have been a thousand times better than you showing me your stupid design. I don't care. I don't care that you think you've made the user interface look good. I don't care how much work you put into it. You could have put 10,000 man hours into rounding off every sharp corner that I might bleed out and die as a result of. You could have spent 10,000 hours unflattening all the stupid flat design that you've shoved down our throats for 10 years straight. And I would not care in the slightest because in the end, what you have done is given me something that you think is a little prettier, but is objectively a far worse, more workflow damaging design. And it's not just the back button, it's all over the place. Everything in Windows 11 works against you. It's kind of like when Windows 8 came out. That stupid charm bar that you have to go to one of the two hot corners on the right and wait for a delay for it to pop out and then if it pops out and you happen to move outside of the column, which if you do a quick movement, you probably will. But if you move outside of the column in the slightest, it goes away and you have to reactivate the hot corner again. That was Windows 8. Now you would think by now with the mess that was Vista and the friggin' AOL kids looking disaster that was Windows 8, that was so embarrassing that they actually had to go in and make boot to desktop the default again and fix the brain dead tiled start menu, the full screen start menu, so it was just a bit less stupid. Like you would think after all that, that they wouldn't do something this ridiculous. And yet here we are, here we go again. You know, Windows 10 was crap and they decrapified a lot of their worst decisions. Um, 
and we sort of got used to the fact that the tiles existed, even though they still look gaudy and dumb. Um, and we would still rather have the multi-tier start menu with denser elements back. But no, no, we get the, 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 the baby toy computer touchscreen tile crap. But in Windows 11, they made everything spaced out like it's supposed to be baby toy touchscreen tile crap. They have to have the, all this room around every element so that they can put their stupid rounded rectangles or squircles or whatever the hell you want to call them around everything. Like if you click a file, oh, it can't just have a box. You know, it can't just have a little light blue highlight that's just got corners like a normal box. No, we need more room so we can have a nice bold line with a big radius in the corner. That, that, that because that's important. That's what users care about. <clears throat> uh-huh. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah, this one back button element screwing up my workflow so bad, and it's just one element. But it was so bad that I noticed it repeatedly to the point of absolute frustration. It's like, there's no excuse for that, guys. There's no excuse whatsoever. You didn't have to do that. There was no need for you to do that. There was no reason for you to do that. And you need to undo that. And let's go over a few more really absolutely stupid choices. Now this machine, I had to update it to 23H2 and send it on its way. I haven't actually um, noted the differences between the different Windows 11 feature updates. So I might be getting some things mixed up here. There may be some things that are no longer the case in, in this list because I was working with the um, feature update prior to 23H2, probably 22H2, whatever came out of the box. Um, it had not been updated to 23H2 yet. So because I'm working with that, um, I'm not sure, but one of the things that really pissed me off is I can't make the taskbar icon small, which I think they took away and will never give back. But more annoyingly, I can't put labels to the right of the taskbar icons when they're open. This is actually an insanely useful feature. Being able to have the names of the programs and to not have the windows hidden behind a single icon for the program. It is so useful. I can't even begin to explain how useful it is. When you've got 10 folders open, the last thing you want is to have to go down to an explorer icon, hover, wait for a delay period, and then a bunch of tiles come up that you can't read the contents of because they're giant file explorer windows smushed down into a tiny thumbnail you can't read, and you, ha and, and you hope and pray that it's actually got the title bar listed out in a font big enough to see, but it's so hard to look through all these tiles when you could just have little compact rectangles at the bottom with all the names already spelled out, no delay, no waiting, none of it. It's just there. And you go down there and, and you got 10 Explorer windows open. You can easily cherry pick whatever it is that you got. You got uh, eight Firefox windows open. You know, you can easily cherry pick which one it is that you want. But they took that away. Now everything is always hidden behind an icon. And I know they're supposed to have brought it back and I didn't check to see whether they did bring it back. But it was so stupid and nobody wanted that. Nobody wanted to have that choice taken away from them. Nobody. There, if you find somebody who says that they would, they're like, oh, please, God, Daddy, Microsoft, please steal my choices away harder, Daddy, then maybe you should take them out back and do the old, old yeller in the shed because they are clearly infected with a moron disease and need to be put down. Yeah, nobody asked Microsoft to do that. There are, um, there are so many things wrong with Windows 11 that it kills me. The start menu is stupid. I don't want recommendations on my start menu for programs that aren't on my computer. You can take that and shove it up your butt. But more importantly, if I just want to see my, my programs, why is it that you give me these little, little tile-like icons, like, and, and they're somewhat densely packed, not very, but a little densely packed, in a vertical orientation, icon, title. You give me like three rows of that. In, in, in like the pinning area for your new Windows Start menu. But then if I hit all apps, by the way, they're programs, not apps or applications. They are programs. Call them programs. This app thing needs to go. An app is an appetizer. I'm not eating 
you know, Hulu or YouTube or whatever. I'm, I'm not consuming it. I am running a program on a computer. This is not a baby toy little tablet. All right. When I hit all apps to get, you know, the original normal everyday start menu, the one that lists the programs on your system, why is it that I just get a column and in that column there's an item, enough room to fit like one and a half items, and then another item? Why do you give me this extremely sparsely populated list? Why you just you make it so that I have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll just to find the program I'm looking for? Oh, well then just use the search. What if I don't know what the program is that I'm searching for? More importantly, if I'm clicking start, then I want to be able to go up to start and just click the thing that I want. Oh, well, why don't you just pin it? What if I can't pin everything? What if I don't want to pin everything? What if I don't want to search for everything? See, one of the reasons that people clutter their stupid computers with desktop icons is because otherwise they have to suffer through your stupid start menu. Bring back the Windows 95 start menu if you're going to do this crap. Back in the day, Windows 95 had a multi-tier start menu. Start, and then you have programs, and I can't remember everything, but it's like programs, documents, settings, um, shut down, restart, I don't remember. <clears throat> it's been so long since I touched it, but you'd hit start. You did have a pinning area at the top, but you go to programs, which will show all the programs. Now, I will say I'm totally okay with the Windows 7 style where you have the programs on the left in a column instead of having to click programs to get it. That was okay. Um, maybe that wasn't 7 style. Anyway, Whenever I'd use 7, I'd always revert to the classic style start menu. And because then I can just get a column of programs. And if it had multiple icons for a program, it'd be in a program folder. And it was pretty easy to find what I needed that way. And because of the density of the information displayed, I was able to look at a lot of things quickly because things generally were in alphabetical order. And if they weren't, I could right click and sort. It's very quick to scan for what it is you're looking for and find it and use it. Uh, if you were just completely confused and didn't know, like you knew kind of what it was called but not where it was, you could fall back on search, but you didn't have to because you could just find what you were looking for. I swear to God, this search paradigm needs to die. This thing where all the email clients have this stupid universal search bar where the title bar is supposed to be needs to die. I don't run searches on my email that often. Get it out of there. Give me back my screen space. Stop putting dumb user interface elements and stop, you know, making things like a dumb search bar monopolized. You know what would make more sense instead of that search bar? Um, if you're going to throw my title bar away so I can't just go up anywhere at the top and grab the window and split screen or shuffle it around, if you're going to steal that capability from me, why don't you just take what would have been the toolbar, okay, like in Thunderbird or Outlook or whatever, take the mail toolbar, okay, put that where the search is. In fact, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. If you're going to steal my title bar away, put the toolbar in the title bar area and make one of the items a little quick search box. Don't put a gigantic, heavily padded search box at the top of my mail client that I'm almost never going to use and I don't want. You know, it's just like removing title bars is something that should not happen. It needs to stop happening. And you know, Apple actually had it right. They made title bars that are skinny, that they're not tall, they're skinny. And those title bars have the title. And every program has a title bar with a title. Every window has a title bar with a title. It's part of the window decoration of the system. And <clears throat> it's, it's not something that you just, all these programs override and get to just toss out in favor of their crappy, inferior, um, non-matching interface. If you run Firefox or Chrome on Mac OS versus on Windows, you quickly see that the Windows interface doesn't have a title bar and the Mac OS one does. And the, ta the title bar that was stolen on Windows just becomes a tab bar on Mac OS. They don't allow them to override the native interface of the system like that. 
And they shouldn't. They shouldn't override it. Because the whole point of a standard interface is that it's a standard interface. It is not changing every time you open a different program. So you don't have this schizophrenic, I don't know what, what kind of paradigm I am today thing going on. Like, why, why does Firefox have to have some sort of weird droppy down thing in the top left corner instead of the window controls? Why, why does it override that? Why does it shove the tab bar in the title bar? I mean, it's great that you can save space, but why can't I have that choice? Why do you take it away from me? And I know there are things that have it, but I'm talking about these major browsers that are applying these stupid styles to things. Why? Why do you have the tabs in older versions of browsers look like they're file folder tabs, but then you just, they've basically thrown it all away um, and just gone with <clears throat> mostly square tabs at this point. Like, are these people stupid? Stop changing the interface. I, I remember back in Firefox 4 when they took the standard menu bar, toolbar, address bar at the top, and they shoved most of it up into a, a Firefox button in the top left corner that popped down a menu that now is a stupid hamburger menu, the three-line menu, they call it a hamburger menu, on the right. You know, stop doing that. Why, why can't you just let me have a normal menu bar? And see, the thing is, now you've added a click for every single control. And I know I've strayed from Windows 11, but it, it applies to Windows 11 too. And all new software is like this. Everything has more clicks added to it. Everything has lower information density. And because of the way that they lower the information density, they also force you to perform more actions to be able to actually do what you want to do or find what you want to find. Everything takes more scrolling. Everything takes more levels of clicking. Everything is more hidden. Everything is harder to discover. These are directly against the fundamental principles of user interface design. Discoverability is crucial. And the thing is, once I've learned how to use an interface, it used to be that the interface changes over time would be very slow, drip fed, and they would be very well thought out, well researched, whatever, and they wouldn't make waves. Like if you go from Office 95 to Office 97 to Office 2000 to Office XP to Office 2003, there are changes between the versions. At, at some point, I think it was Office 2000, they started having this thing pop out of the right hand side, it's like task view or something. Um, some feature no one cared about and everybody just wanted to know how to get it to go away. Um, they, they, but for the most part, they did not change the core feature set of Office between 95 and 2003. That's what, eight years worth of Microsoft Office. If you count up till they released 2007 with the ribbon, um, it was 11 or 12 years worth of Microsoft Office you always had the same basic set of toolbars. You always had the, um, the, the toolbars were basically the same, although they were customizable. The layout of a blank document was the same. You had the ruler was the same. The, um, all the controls that might've been at the bottom were in the same general place. Everything was close enough to one another that if you opened Office 2003 and you were an Office 95 user, you would feel a little weird because the colors change. They had a, a bit more of a 3D, um, a more rounded look to things, like the toolbar buttons were more, a bit more poppy and had like a blue coloration instead of being flat gray. But, 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 if you needed to change the font, make the text bold, if you needed to um, print, or save, those buttons were consistently always in the exact same place and looked similar. They were not identical, but they looked very similar to every version prior. So 11 years worth of Office, arguably more. I mean, even just like Microsoft Works on Windows 3.1 back in the early 90s, you know, all, arguably all the way back to some of the first versions of Word. <clears throat> the, the toolbar for um, fi the file toolbar and the formatting toolbar 
the same. Now, yes, things moved around, you know, features were added, some stuff was changed, some stuff might have been, you know, they added uh, the ability to collapse toolbar elements, you could add new buttons, whatever. But for the most part, the interface was consistent and basically identical. So someone who moved, made a big move to a decade newer version of Microsoft Office would still be able to get their work done with an extremely shallow learning curve. In Office 2007, all of that changed with the ribbon. Now, I have not watched the videos that I had intended to. Um, there are some old presentations on how they came up with and tested the ribbon, did a bunch of user testing. We're like, oh yeah, this works better. Um, I still believe that's stupid because frankly, the ribbon is still a problem to this day. Oh my God, another stupid Cybertruck. Those are the ugliest cars on the planet. If you if you buy a Cybertruck, you're an idiot. Um, that or you really, really like driving what looks like a tin can that somebody threw at a wall a bunch of times. Anyway, uh, Cybertruck distraction over. <clears throat> but you can you can take someone with an old skill set, move them up to a new one. Then on Office 2007, the ribbon comes out. The ribbon replaces the toolbar paradigm completely with a toolbox paradigm. So now you have tabs at the top that completely change out all of your toolbars, and you no longer have toolbars, you have tool rectangles. You have these like tool buckets almost. I, I'm not sure of a better way to explain them. They are, they are like, um, that you have little sectioned off buttons that contain your editing tools. And like, you do not have the formatting stuff in the same place. Now it's near where it originally would have gone, but it is not in the same place and it does not look the same. So your formatting stuff has changed. Um, it still uses the same icon, so you can figure out that the bold B probably means that it bolds your text. So yeah, you, you know, there's a shallow learning curve for finding the simple formatting options again, but the menu bar is gone. They threw out the menu bar and the toolbars and replaced it with the ribbon. So now, okay, I want to do page setup, which, which, where's file and page setup? Oh, well, in Office 07, there is no file menu. They got that dumb orb in the corner, and if I recall correctly, you hit the orb and go down to page setup, which makes no logical sense. Orb is not file, orb is, is orb. And that that's the problem. They completely changed the paradigm, and there was no gradual introduction. There, there wasn't even like some sort of tutorial you could run. And, and even if there was, it wouldn't happen if you were using Office on a computer that someone else owned which was a much more common thing back in the early 2000s and mid 2000s where people couldn't afford computers as much. Like the netbook, you know, the $300 laptop, $300, $400 little portable um, purse carryable laptop is actually what brought computers for, I wanna say everyone, but it's not quite that much into the mainstream, but it wasn't until like 2010 that you could just sort of count on everybody pretty much has a computer at home or access to one. Um, so you, you'd have a lot of shared instances of office applications and shared hardware. <clears throat> and you would not get a tutorial if you weren't the one who ran office for the first time. So how do you know about these changes? Well, you better hope you can either figure it out, which by the way, discoverability is greatly limited because now which tab would I find the button for this on? And if the button's not there, which which one of these tool boxes underneath the tabs? So you need to figure out which tab, which box, and then some of them have a little arrow at the bottom right corner that lets you see more options that aren't listed in that box. So now we have a three-tier toolbar system replacing a menu bar, and a standard set of two toolbars with others that you can turn on for certain features like say drawing or making um, tables or whatever. So dumping the entire menu bar and toolbar that are all standard for a potentially up to three clicks down, actually more than that because some of those would just open dialogues that had even more stuff under them. <clears throat> so now you've taken what was like a menu system that maybe the menu system had two or three clicks, but it was the menu system. Anything you could do on the toolbars, you could do through a menu, 
um, it was just buried a little bit deeper. And yes, there was duplication, but the whole point of a toolbar is these are very frequently used things. So we make it a one-click function to bold text, to pick a new font, to uh, increase or decrease the point size, to superscript. You know, it's a one-click function for a reason because it's a frequently used function. And so making it immediate to access and one-click to engage makes it very quick to get your work done. Now you have the stupid um, tabbed, boxed, potentially further drop down ribbon system. And if you're not on the home ribbon, then all your formatting stuff's gone. So if you switch to another ribbon to say pull a chart or set columns or whatever, well, now, you're, now you have to change back to the original toolbox just to be able to do what was always there in previous versions. And they've made it even worse over time. Like, if you've used the latest version of Microsoft Outlook, it's 2024 right now as I'm recording this. If you've used the latest version of Outlook, it's a damn disaster. It's like noth none of the stuff in the mail section looks clickable. Um, like, n nothing... <clears throat> where before you'd have items in a tree and the tree had lines and it, you know, you can it was very obvious what was clickable and what wasn't because of the use of colored icons, bold text, you know, and you also had um, other user elements that would just let you know something was changeable or clickable or whatever. That's all gone now. They have some dumb bar that hides, like you used to have um, contacts and calendar and tasks and all that available to you on the left um, and it would just like whoosh up and replace and it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. You know, Outlook is a pretty wackadoodle user interface all by itself. But now they've collapsed all those buttons and you can't like have some of it up and some of it not. No, now all of it is buttons with no text label. So now you have to hover over each label until you figure out that's what calendar looks like. So it just, they keep just making every single version of every single Office application and every single version of Windows and every single feature update of Windows. They just keep changing things. The learning curve never stops. The learning curve is, is a, a fucking up ramp and it never, ever stops. It, it might lower its rate of increase, but the learning curve always points upward, boy. And it, it's absolutely absurd. I cannot stand it. Um, I don't understand how anybody gets anything done. I, I would almost be willing to go back to Windows 95 just because everything made so much more sense, was easier to get shit done. And, and I gotta be honest, I just had an XP machine come in today with Excel 97 on it. And I opened an Excel document and I was like, I've seen new machines with SSDs open slower than this. Anyway, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, I'm gonna, I, I need to pull over. Take it easy. So you have, hang on. Dickhead. So kernel programmers are great. Um, even if you hate Windows,